Greetings, everyone, and welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Hearn, and I do represent Hearn Fine Art. Um, we are so glad that you are here today for the final When We See Us Artist Talk, not the final programming. We do have a special surprise for you later, but the final artist talk for the current exhibit at uh, Hearn Fine Art, Emerging Arkansas Artist when we see us featuring Ebony Blevins, our featured speaker today, who is going to talk about her work in cyanotype. Uh, Adesia Cooper, mixed media and Perion Heard, scratch paper etchings. So hopefully you can get by the gallery at 1001 Wright Avenue uh, to see that show, um, or you can go online at www.hernfineart.com through March 19th to check out that show. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, but today, we are here to talk Ebony Blevins. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing well. It's a little chilly down here in Texas, but um, I'm doing well. Um, well I'm sure too. it's colder in Arkansas <laughs> being a little bit northern. Um, but uh, we're just going to talk. Just have a little conversation about your career and then we'll get into talking about some of your work in the show and how When We See Us came together. Um, so just from your profile from the Arkansas Department of Heritage, um, I know that you have been an artist uh, for a very, very long time. You knew that you were going to be an artist as a child. Um, can you talk about your childhood in the arts? Um, if you had any support from your parents, can you talk about your development? Let's start there. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Garbo and Hearn Fine Art for you know, um, allowing me to be a part of the show and to do this artist talk. I, I, I tremendously thank, I'm, I'm grateful for you all for this opportunity. But um, I started taking pictures when I was eight, um, started out in the Miller 4-H Club in Pine Bluff. Um, at age 12, I won an award for actually this, this little thing right here that says the day at the zoo. It's a, a photo essay I did at, at age 12 and won a rosette, which is the highest award and a trophy for that. Um, and I shot that with a 110 camera, film camera. But uh, through high school and, and college, I shot a little bit more. Um, my dad would took me to actually he took me to my first photography class at age 14 it was one of those night classes like the extended learning classes for adults but he and I took it together and it was an awesome you know bonding opportunity for us and uh, through high school I, I was on yearbook staff a little bit but I was more active in sports and, and music but in college I started out as an art major but then changed to journalism um, after listening to an unsupportive art professor, I changed to journalism and uh, was on the was student newspaper for doing sports photography and, and other general photography for the, that student paper as well. And in that, in, at Arkansas State, I learned how to uh, do darkroom and develop color film and slide film. And, and it's also where I learned the cyanotype process and, and did it the first time. And then also, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> also, uh, you know, after college, then I was working at the Ar at Arkansas, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette for a little bit. And then now currently I freelance for AY Magazine, Arkansas Money and Politics Magazines as well. Along with, I've had some work published at OTAR Magazine, which is based out of Sweden. Um, there was a writer who did an article on the anti-trans bills here in Arkansas and in Tennessee, and I followed him around for two days while he interviewed people here and in Memphis. And um, that work can be found online as well. I can share a link later or, or if anybody's interested. So. Let's talk about this unsupportive art professor <laughs> and the con. No, I mean, like, hey, sometimes our haters can be our biggest motivation. Mm -hmm. um, but let's just talk about that angle really quickly, as in, you know, you were 
I'm assuming doing like a traditional art program, like a BFA when it comes to like maybe painting or sculpture, but then you changed over to something else that would be considered an art, which is, you know, photography and more journalism. What, what is your take on that when people say photographers aren't artists, their journalists aren't artists? What is your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, we are still artists, we, even though we're capturing what we see in front of us. Um, it's similar to like a still life artist. They're, they're painting what they see in front of them. I'm just painting with light um, using the camera. And so photographers are still artists regardless. You know, it's just a different, it's just a different mode of creative expression. And uh, to that college professor, I'm still an artist um, despite your uh, unsupportive, you know, thoughts and um, Back then, they didn't have a art photography program. It started like my last semester in school. And so that's why I ended up going to photojournalism. But I've always loved photography. I've always loved going through family photo albums and uh, boxes of pictures. And, and still, as a child, one thing, we had a set of encyclopedias. And I used to shut myself up in the bathroom because that's the only place I could have privacy since I shared a room with my sister. Um, and just look through the pictures in the encyclopedias. I've always loved pictures. Awesome. Um, so, <clears throat> and you found a way to just do art regardless of what that professor said or do, you know, because photography is not the only medium um, that you've experimented in. Um, can you talk about what other mediums that you've worked in and why and what brought you to, well, we know what brought you to photography, but um, can you talk about your experience and some of the other mediums you've worked in? Well, lately I've been experimenting uh, with tie-dye and so I'm hoping to incorporate tie-dye and combine it with the cyanotype process. And also I, I used to do more commonly leather work and uh, I found a way to print photos on leather, but I need to further experiment with that as well. And I just, I just, you know, go back to, I, 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 I tend to satisfy my inner child's curiosity, you know, and just experimenting and have fun and and play and make art that's that's what I that's what I try to do or actually that's what I do <laughs> not try try implies failure so yeah at one point um were you experimenting with like printmaking at some point some some point or had that come into your photography at any point no. I just remember <laughs> seeing you at yellow dog press you had a show there but they were your photographs Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, was, um, I, I mm -hmm. had the ahead. opportunity to I had the opportunity to, to do that show there at Yellow Dog Press, but no, I haven't gotten into or or attempted uh, printmaking. Closest I've gotten to it is the cyanotype process, which is still a form of printmaking. But yes, that's that's I haven't done lino cut like like Perian with this piece right there, or uh, or anything else. So, um, but the, like the, the typeset, I've always loved fonts and stuff too. So I experiment also with hand lettering as well, but I haven't done anything well in that yet to, to show it off. Let's talk about the cyanotype process. Um, how were you introduced to it? Uh, can you walk us through that process? I know it's definitely a visual thing, but can you talk about the process for you and how you were introduced to it? Yeah, and uh, like we only did it for like one day at Arkansas State, and um, it's a process that uses UV light to create the image onto the paper. Once you uh, put sanitizing solution, sensitizing, like photographic solution on there, um, the solution itself react has a, a chemical reaction with water to create the image, and it, it comes out blue because of the 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 chemicals that are in it, uh, the, the, I think it's like ferrous cyanide and iron and other things. I can't remember exactly, but um, for each of the prints that people see at the, at the show, I have hand printed those. I had to hand cut the paper. I um, coated it with the solution, the chemical solution, exposed it to light. I had to create a negative for each one of those prints uh, and print them uh, 
more than you know what you see there i have a stack of other prints that aren't as great but um I, i'll lay the negative on on the paper i expose it to uv light either with the sun or with a uv lamp um and then the paper changes color i, I have to expose it for about 30 minutes for each print and um and then after that, I take it and put it in water and then the chemical reaction happens and it develops the image. I add a little uh, hydrogen peroxide to get it to oxidize and darken faster because over time, if I didn't do the peroxide, it would still get, get darker, but it would just take a lot longer. And then uh, rinse it and I hang it to dry. But like I said, for each one of those prints, I've, I've done them each one by hand. Do you feel like the, the cyanotype gives a photograph or the documentary image more of the fine art feel? Yes, that's that was um, that that was my point of view with with taking using that process rather than just getting it printed, you know, sending it off to a lab and getting it printed because each one is unique because, you know, the the chemistry is spread on on the paper differently for each one and um, sometimes the exposure is just a little bit different at times too. So, but each one is unique, and um, that's what I like about bringing like a, a digital, a digital uh, expression combined with the analog process. And I, that's what I like to bring the, the old school and new school together. Absolutely stunning body of work. Um, before we get into talking about this um, exhibition, um, let's just talk about the Central Arkansas creative community and how this community has nurtured you or supported you. Um, and you've been a, a member of this community for a long time. You grew up in you know, this area and in this state. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Central Arkansas creative community and what you feel is happening and what you look forward to? Yes. Um, yeah, the Central Arkansas creative community is wonderful. I mean, it's like a family. I do a lot of photography of uh, live concerts and performances around here as well as, you know, going out and documenting the protests. And so I have years and years of uh, live concert photography of local and national acts here uh, when they come to Little Rock or to other parts of Arkansas as well. And um, just the, the community itself is, is, is really supportive and I appreciate, you know, people who appreciate me as well. And I try to support them like they support me and, and try to uplift them as well through my photography. All right, so let's talk about um, emerging Arkansas artists when we see us. Um, can you talk about how you met Perion and have you had any prior interaction with the Deja or, you know, what, what is your relationship like with the other artists and how did you come to be a part of this show? Yeah, me and, me and Perion were Facebook friends for a while and then I finally just like met him in person. He had posted something about a print and I had like, this uh, long definition of an original print that was like typeset and it was a, antique. And I just took it to him at his job one day when he was, when he used to work at that bakery. So, um, and then after that, we just kind of just hit it off and became really good friends and supportive of each other's art and, and creative pursuits. And then with Adesia, uh, she's part of the Seventh Street Mural Project and she's had her mural to face like several times. And I'm also part of the Seven Street Mural Project. I have a photo printed on, uh, printed by my friend, uh, Bob Starr. He uh, donated vinyl and he has a vehicle wrap company, uh, Game Time Wraps. And they, like I said, they donated the, the print for, for the mural. And so it's an actual photo up on the wall there at the murals and then surrounded by uh, a design that I created, but the painters, you know, uh, Jose, Jose uh, Hernandez has, uh, I'm sorry, my mind just went blank for a second. Jose painted the design that I created uh, around the, the photo, but Adesia uh, is so very awesome and so very talented. And I love that at 21, she is like, 
a superstar already in the art community around here. And I just can't wait to see how how her work will will blossom and continue to, you know, grow. And the same with Perry too. He he's he's been doing amazing work and I was there when I documented he I documented his uh, the process of painting those banners at the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. Uh, people think those banners on the outside of the building are printed, but they're hand painted. And I documented the process through uh, time lapse video and still. So that was an awesome experience as well. Tell me about the title of the show, Emerging Arkansas Artists, When We See Us. What does that mean to you and for you? Well, for me, um, <clears throat> The main thing is getting your work out there for people to see. You just need the right uh, set of eyes on your work. And when people see us, then all possibilities and all potential, you know, is, is really seen in our work. You know, it gives us a chance to um, have more opportunity whenever we are seen as opposed to like hiding my work or hiding our work and and not posting it and being afraid to share, you know, with the world, your creative gifts. I don't know if that makes any sense, but, uh, but yeah, that's the main thing is just, you know, we have to, we have to be brave and, and put our, ourselves out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, let's get into the work. I'm going to share my screen. And, you know, by the virtue of alphabetical order, you're at the top of the screen. Hey, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, you got to make it work for you. I know. Um, is there any particular, well, well, let's back up a little bit. Can you talk about the central theme for this particular body of work? I mean, when we look at it, it is very explicitly clear. Um, but talk about how this body of work came to be. Yeah, so when the protests first began, I felt a tremendous sense of responsibility to get out and document as much of the protest actions as I could. Um, at the time, I was just freelancing, you know, for the magazines and not, I didn't have like a regular, a regular job. Uh, so I had a little bit more flexibility than others to get out there. So I was out there more, more commonly than other photographers. And so this is only a, a snippet of the over 50,000 images that I, I captured um, throughout these protests and still am going out and, and documenting other protests as well, because on, what was that, Valentine's Day, whenever uh, Governor Asa Hutchison did his State of the State address and there were protesters that interrupted that address. I was there for that. And then the police escalated to the violence uh, right as soon as the protesters stepped outside the door, slamming people on the ground and against the wall. But um, like I said, the main thing is I just felt a sense of responsibility to get out and document. I had documented my first protest uh, ever back in 2001, whenever PETA had protested outside the Stevens building here in Little Rock. And then also, and I think it was 2006, I went to Gina, Louisiana for the Gina 6 uh, rally down there. And I need to post some more of that work as well. Um, but um, in 2014, I wanted to go to Ferguson, but I was scared. So I did end up, I ended up not going, but I also regretted not going as well. And so whenever the protests came to my hometown, I had to get out. And, uh, and, and capture as much as I could of, of all the awesome things that I saw and all the terrible things that I saw and experienced as well. Uh, let's talk about your subjects. Uh, are they posed? Do you put, I mean, you know, when you're out there on the ground in the field at these protests, uh, you know, you've caught some very striking images. Have you ever, you know, posed anybody or, you know, what is your process for, for capturing, you know, the, these, these literally snapshots in time? Yeah, uh, most of the pictures are not posed. Most of the time I just capture people as they're doing 
various things like um uh, like that protester in the street right there um that was in portland and he just happened to decide to try and block traffic and i was like let me let me capture that anything that looks like it's temporary and um and or or seems like it might be fleeting i try my best to capture it and um and still like the the picture with the the guys and the guns off to the right um that was posed but they they set that you know that group i didn't set the shot up um and then there were other photographers as well that captured this image as well but um but yeah just usually i just i just capture what i see every now and then i may stop somebody and have them uh pose or i'll have them stop and just capture them right there in that moment. But like I said, the most most of it is not posed. Just, you know, the only one, there's only like one or two, maybe the, that lady at the bottom was posed and then the guys with the guns, but everything else just happened organically. One of the uh, most talked about pictures uh, from this show that's gotten a lot of uh, spotlight has been this picture. Um, when it comes to photographing children out in the field, um, I know that you know sometimes parents can be super protective. How how is your what's what's your approach to photographing children when you don't necessarily know them or do you know this child? I don't make no. any assumptions. No, I don't because that was actually I took that one at a rally in Dallas, and so I didn't know anybody there at that rally, um, any of the protesters or anything. And so sometimes I just take the picture. Um, some, if the parent is right there, then I'll ask, you know, if it's okay, because in these days and times, people don't always want, you know, their children documented. So, um, but in this instance, you know, this child actually, she actually used the bullhorn. I have another shot where she's actually um, speaking into the bullhorn as well. And I couldn't decide if I wanted to use this shot where she looked at me or the other shot where she was, uh, chanting into the bullhorn, but I ended up using this one because it had, it felt more, um, it was more of a connection with, with whoever is viewing the image in this version. So, uh, but yeah, usually sometimes I'll ask for permission, but other times I'll just go ahead and capture it and then ask for permission. And, um, but yeah, I just try to capture as I see it, as I see it. Uh, do you have any plans to, I, I know you are, um, you've done a lot of protests work. Do you, would you like to take your career to, you know, the ultimate photojournalist level? Are you wanting to go into war zones? Are you wanting to go, you know, travel internationally? Would you like to, you know, do more protests? What, what are your aspirations for your photography for career? Well, um, I know in college, I used to want to go to war zones, but watching this footage right now with the Ukrainian crisis, I don't think I have the courage to go and deal with the war zone right now. Um, I mean, me dealing with these protests was enough. And um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I'm just going to leave all my options open. Any opportunities that arise, you know, I will do my best to hop on them. And um, there's really no telling. All right, now I'm also exploring, you know, crypto and uh, the NFTs, and I'm learning that process. I have some other, uh, another photojournalist friend who's pretty successful in that field, and I'm working to uh, develop my community dealing with that as well. So I can also bring that knowledge back to uh, the community here in real life, as, as opposed to the virtual community. Um, so that uh, other people can learn the process as well and they can build residual income through the NFTs as well. Definitely a good segue into my next question. Um, I guess in layman's terms, can you break down just <laughs> as much as you possibly can, uh, what is an NFT and, and why should we uh, as a creative community be embracing it or just even learning more about it? Well, I won't say that everybody should embrace it because it's not a good fit for everybody. Uh, some people may not feel comfortable 
dealing with the blockchain and, and the newness of it all, but I really feel like the internet is heading in that direction, a less, uh, a more decentralized um, direction uh, with the blockchain. The, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, well, NFT stands for non-fungible token, which means that it has each uh, item or file has its own value in and of itself, and it can't be exchanged for something um, other than money. You know, like $2 bills are worth the, the same thing, but uh, a $10 and a $1 bill is not worth the same. So it's not, it's fungible in that, in that you can use another dollar bill to represent the same amount. But um Non-fungible means that it's a unique, it's a unique file uh, that is uh, certifiable through the blockchain, which is a secure. Oh, this is oh my gosh! Trying to explain all of this. Um, the uh, the blockchain itself is a centralized technology, and there are tons of computers out here co constantly like verifying all the transactions and files on the block each blockchain. They're different. There are different kinds of blockchains. I'm still learning so much about this. And it's still really difficult for me to explain it in layman's terms because I'm still at the very beginning stages of learning it all myself. But it's definitely a good thing that you're, you're receptive and open to learning about it. Um, I definitely, I'm, I'm me as a, art historian and art professional I'm still trying to figure out if it's worth even exploring so you report back for all of us <laughs> well one thing you know if people want to learn more about it I say get on if you already have a Twitter account get on or or not then create a, a Twitter account go into Twitter spaces which is a, a function on Twitter where people have audio rooms similar to Clubhouse and uh, Discord um, and Telegram, I think Telegram too does it too, but um, it's just audio conversations, it's like a live podcast pretty much where each, each room has different topics and you can hear people talk about their experiences uh, with NFTs and with cryptocurrency or just other random topics as well. You know, I've seen people do rooms on uh, meditation. I've seen some on uh love life and men and i've seen some on like the ukrainian crisis and all kinds of other things but you know you're having a conversation with people all around the world that's one thing i do like about it is that you're building genuine connection with other people you know all around the world and it's it's really um uh, it's an awesome way of connecting with people through social media as opposed to the other social media that we're used to with like facebook where it's kind of like just people's highlight reels and you can't really like connect with people and you just feel like a sense of, uh, I guess, kind of envy or, you know, not even really like, maybe even like jealousy, you know, of seeing what people are doing better than you or whatever. And, uh, but with Twitter spaces and clubhouse, those, those conversations are a lot more fulfilling. To segue into my next question, um, how has social media um, and more access to a wider audience um, impacted your career or your work? Um, it has provided an avenue for people all over the world to see my work. And social media is wonderful in that aspect. And just, just providing a way for artists to put their work out there without having to uh, feel like they may be gatekeep uh, the dealing with the gatekeepers of galleries. No offense, you know I love Hearn Fine Art, but um, a lot of you know a lot of artists feel like there's a lot of gatekeeping going on with you know galleries or being shown for other shows and stuff. But through social media allows you an avenue to show your work and to spread the word and build your community of interested, you know, of interested people that may buy your work. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> when you were going into photography and journalism, um, 
Did you have any historic or contemporary inspirations? Um, and then just as a follow-up, are there any fellow photographers or other artists that you're excited about right now? Um, a lot of my inspiration is uh, just the people I interact with, but you know, always you know the the usual Gordon Parks and Roy De Caraba and um, other other photographers. You know, even like from the cyanotype process, Annie Annie Atkins is the one that started you know uh, the printing of that process, documenting plant material, and so. Um, but currently, you know, one of my favorite mentors is uh, Jamel Shabazz. And he documented or is still documenting uh, like hip hop as it, it started in the 70s up through today. He still goes out in, uh, in New York and, and documents just like city life and, and just people on the street. And he has several books and it was so awesome to get a chance to meet him in, in 2000. And I still stay in contact with him uh, today. And then another photographer that, um, is dear and, and is a good friend is Norman Deshong and he's based out of New Jersey. He's another awesome photographer and I met him whenever he was doing work for uh, Roy Jones Jr. He was his photographer for his fights and stuff. And I happened to be working for uh, Take Full Records based out of New Orleans, which is where Bounce Music began. As uh, Roy Jones Jr. was signing one of the artists from Take Full Records. And so we've, we've been friends, you know, since that experience, since we met back in, I think, two, 2003 or 2004, something like that. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so when it comes to being a journalist and doing photojournalism and even in the practice of photography itself, um, you're charged with... Um, reporting the news almost, capturing the image. Um, where do you feel like, um, I guess your identity as a black woman, does that have, um, does that come into play when it comes into your photographs? Um, do you think that it shapes how you capture your subjects? Um, how does your identity um, translate through your work if at all for me I don't think it translates through my work it may disarm you know some people at times just for me being a woman uh, out there documenting and, and taking pictures um, but I don't think it really uh, I don't know I haven't really thought about that how that may change my gaze at uh, my subjects and things like that maybe it's maybe I'm more I don't know. I don't know because like when I talk with the other male photographers that are around, I'll ask them, hey, did you get, did you see this over here? And they're like, oh no, I didn't capture that. You know, it's just every, every photographer has their own style, you know, and I, my femininity, I don't think, I don't think comes through, <laughs> through the, uh, through my work. Uh, per se I just like I said I just document what I see and if something seems interesting to me then I'll take a picture of it and then I'll come back to it later if it and see if it was or if it wasn't interesting here's a sort of a follow-up question um with uh the image being so powerful I mean you know we have Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, a lot of these things are captured, you know, on a phone or with somebody's camera. What do you think the role of the photographer or the photojournalist is now in these social movements in our modern day civil rights movements right now? Well, today um, it's a lot easier for people to document things as they happen since we all have a high quality phone in our, I mean, a high quality camera <laughs> in our pockets on our phones. Um, for the longest, it was just interesting. Like I remember in college, how I used to carry my camera around everywhere. And back then I was shooting film and 
it just seemed like a part of me but I don't now I don't carry my camera like that as much and I just find myself using my phone more often and for other people you know it provides them an avenue to start in photography more easily rather than having to buy an expensive camera you have your expensive phone with a high quality camera to start at least and you know my advice to anybody is to take lots of pictures you know fail until you take you still you start taking great pictures because it'll happen i've taken tons of pictures over the years and um i've been a professional photographer for what almost over 25 years now so my first paid job was in 97. So well, at this time, um, I definitely welcome our audience members to ask questions. Um, you are allowed to unmute and ask your questions or you can put them in the chat and I can ask them. Um, but I really liked uh, what you just said and that you've been a photographer and been supported for almost 25 years. Um, and you, you gave some advice to future photographers to start taking pictures what do you say to the parent or the guardian of the young child or anyone who's like I want to grow up and be a photojournalist a photographer what are your 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 advice to that person well I mean one thing I could say is for them to support you know the kids efforts whatever their creative efforts don't discourage them encourage them to pursue any creative effort as long as it's healthy and you know they're having fun just just get out there and and just do it don't don't be afraid you know don't don't think that because you don't have the newest shiniest camera or whatever that you still can't do quality pictures i have done whatever camera is in my hand at the time is the best camera for me it doesn't have to be a certain brand or anything i just take pictures <laughs> And so um, to the parents, you know, sometimes you maybe even want to take a class with them like my dad did with me. And you might even become, you know, you might fall in love with photography yourself and become a photographer along with your kids. So you just never know. Um, you just never know until you try it. Definitely. I, do, I appreciate that response. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from... Our audience, anybody curious about any of the works, want a backstory about any of the pieces in the show? <laughs> Would you like to provide uh, any backstory um, about any of the pieces or do you have a particular favorite or, you know? Yeah, we could go through, uh, so go back to the rushing off to the right underneath the guys with the gun down right there. So with this piece, um, I was in, that was uh, one of the shots taken in Portland as well. Um, that is a line of police and uh, they were rushing at us with the press and the protesters and so I call this one rushing because I was running and taking pictures at the same time. So that's why there's everything is kind of blurry and and everything like that. But you can see like the the nightstick in I think the second uh, officer's hand, um, and then like the what is it the third officer from the left. You can see that he has a gas mask on, and that's one thing that in Portland the police always did is gas the the protesters a lot and there were some protesters there that were out there standing out in front with no protection for the, the gas and it was just it was that experience of being in Portland for a week is was traumatic and also very enlightening um as to how unethical the police can be in the treatment of protesters and press and legal observers and um, and it's crazy because some of the police officers that I know here in Little Rock were like, oh, we heard that the, the Portland police were, were doing well. I was like, no, being there, they were very unethical. They were slashing tires of support vehicles, like their snack van for the protesters and stuff. And 
it's just a lot of stuff that they were doing that was not right. <laughs> and I saw a little bit of that here with the state police. I had one of my friends, um, she was standing in line and I wasn't there for that, that part, but she got hit in the stomach with one of the tear gas canisters during the protest here in Little Rock. It was just, it was just a crazy experience. And then um, if you go back up just a little bit to that one in the middle at UAMS or down one more. Okay, we can talk about that one too. <laughs> That's fine. Um, that day, um, you can bring the one up with the organizers. So both of these people are uh, protest organizers. They helped you know, bring, bring about the crowds, you know, they just, they simply just said they were going to start these events and start doing these actions and learning about the protest process. And that was also the day that I think it was Donald Trump's birthday. And so all, all these drag queens came out to protest that day. And um, the one on the, 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 actually there's only one drag queen. So that was a female protest organizer, Azaria uh, McClinton and, uh, Athena Sinclair is that queen's stage name, also known as MD Hunter. And uh, MD, whenever he's not in drag, is still currently active uh, with these, these anti-trans bills. He'll go and, uh, and protest and speak out against these bills at the uh, committee meetings and, and things like that with the, with the legislators. Now, if you go back, the shot below that one right here yeah that, that one so people didn't realize like UAMS the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences uh, had a day where they had all the doctors out uh, or most of the doctors out for during the Black Lives Matter protests and you know they were just showing their support and solidarity of the protest effort and um, a lot of people didn't realize that that even happened. And I was glad I was, I was there that day for this picture and, and the other pictures I shot from that event as well. Question, um, how has COVID complicated your work? Um, you know, as someone out on the fields, mostly surrounded by a lot of people, how has, how, has it complicated it at all? Has, how, what impact has COVID had on your work as an artist, as a photographer, as a photojournalist? Well, as a photographer, at first I was, um, I wasn't booking shoots. Then the protest started and I was like, well, F it. I'll just get out and take these pictures. I'll risk my health and risk my life. <laughs> To, to document because I felt like it was that important for me to get out there and take the pictures. It was more important than my own health and safety um, to tell the, to, to, you know, have my piece of the narrative, or not necessarily my piece, but to, to have my perspective in the narrative of, of these protests. But uh, for my photographic work, it, I, I, all, the only thing I did was I, I, I really kept space from, you know, uh, between me and my clients, I would use a longer lens. Um, we would, I, I would make sure like if I was doing high school seniors that they would take pictures with the mask to document, you know, that it was this point of history and things like that. But um, things did slow down for my photographic work, but I was still busy out with these protests. Have you ever um, been at risk for being detained? Um, no. <laughs> um, the closest I got was actually that picture in Portland. Um, but no, I have not been detained or been close to it. I'm pretty much, I'm a little bit of a Freddy cat when it comes to that and I will try to leave the scene before um, that may happen. If I feel like the energy is changing, then I'll leave. <laughs> but, um, but no, I haven't, I haven't been close to being detained. Um, I have friends that have 
been arrested, um, still like um, Don Jeffrey is still detained and still in, in jail uh, over the protests and, and other actions that, that um, she allegedly did. Um, but, but no, I haven't, I haven't been detained myself. So we do have a question from Facebook from Shannon Farmer. She actually has a few. Um, and this is definitely a good follow up, but how difficult was it for you to decompress after all of the protest coverage? Um, did it surprise you how being out there made it feel? Yeah, I was surprised because like going back compared to the very first protest I shot in 2001, just the treatment of the press by the police. Cause back then the police just saw us as neutral. You know, now police are more suspicious of, of journalists and they wanna know if you're attached with a certain organization or, or with a certain publication and try to verify and, and things like that. And I'm just, I, I really am I'm really just freelance, but for me to decompress one thing I did constantly <laughs> after a protest action is watch Hamilton and sing as loudly as I could at home <laughs> to all the songs. And for some reason, that was always my go-to. I watched, I probably watched Hamilton all about a hundred times at least, and then got a chance to see it live thanks to my friend Shannon Farmer. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's usually that's what I do. And then last week I found out through Twitter Spaces that there is a grant for black journalists to get, um, to help pay for therapy. And so I'm gonna apply for that grant pretty soon um, to put uh, therapy in place because I need it for that and some other, you know, more personal things as well. Definitely, that's very, very important. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, and I think her, her second question is a really great, great way to end this. Um, but if you could give advice to your younger self when you fell in love with photography, what would it be? Knowing what you know now. <laughs> well, knowing what I know now, um, I would just tell myself to not be afraid and to stand up for, for what I believe in and to look out for myself a whole lot more because as much as I help people out all the time, you know, I really need to help myself first and foremost, because I give so much of myself, uh, either through my photography or other ways to help other people, that I need to pour just as much effort into my own, you know, pursuits. And so that's what I've started doing finally, at almost 45 years old, that I'm starting to do more things for myself. And um, I'm working to not feel like it's me being selfish to look out for myself I have to you know it's like the the whole airplane airplane uh, oxygen mask uh, analogy and whenever you have to put your mask on first and take care of yourself before you can take care of anybody else I definitely agree um if we don't have any more questions, um, I would like to give you the opportunity to talk about, and I'll put up some guiding slides, <laughs> how we can get your work and the special announcement about next Saturday. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. So you can find my work on my website, MsCamerlady.com. That's M-S-C-A-M-E-R-A-L-A-D-Y.com. Also, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, um, as Ms. Camera Lady. Again, I, I try to maintain a constant, uh, I'm trying to keep a consistent brand. So like my Instagram, my Facebook, all of it, just look up MsCamerLady.com or Ms. Camera Lady, then you'll probably find <laughs> my, uh, my, you'll find my work. Um, other than that, Saturday at four o'clock, I'm going to do a cyanotype demonstration at Hearn Fine Arts. So if you all want to come by and learn more about the process, then, you know, come check us out. Definitely. It is free. 
Um, you must be masked up, will be socially distanced, but this is definitely a good way um, to for you to learn about a new process. We do welcome the younger audience too, so exposure is always very important. Um, once again, we thank you for coming out virtually to the When We See Us Artist Talks. Um, hopefully everyone on this call and everyone listening on Facebook will have an opportunity to come by the gallery at 1001 Wright Avenue in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and if you don't have an opportunity, we do have a website, www.hermfineart.com. Um, no need to worry about the second link as this is our last artist talk. Um, unless we bring the whole gang together, <laughs> possibly. We'll see. Um, but for now, thank you so much for joining us for when we see us artist talks. Please, um, once again, thank you so much, Ebony, for um, your contributions to the Central Arkansas community and to just journalism as a whole. Um, I don't have any other comments. You want to send us out with, you know, why should we collect Ebony Blevins' work? Well, I mean, my work is dope. That's why. No. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's just my work is a piece of history and, and there's just so much more that I have to share. You know, I have so many more pictures to to print and to share with with everyone and you know, I just appreciate any time people appreciate my work. All righty, folks. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great Sunday and awesome end of Black History Month. We thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, come by Her and Fine Art, 1001 Wright Avenue, and buy Black Art. Have a good afternoon. Bye. All right.